Here it comes. Could be Denver's biggest snowstorm in years. Schools are calling snow days, airlines canceling flights, and we'll take you to the foothills, where the potential for two to four feet of snow has very different preparations going on than what city folk are doing. A conservative activist and gun store owner in Colorado says President Biden should be executed. He's said stuff like that for years, yet Colorado's most prominent Republicans keep cozying up to him. Congresswoman Lauren Boebert makes a wise move today by staying out of a race. The Uniparty stepped in and tried to rig an election. And as we hunker down for the big storm, a bunch of us are going to chip in to buy better rescue gear for Colorado's search and rescue teams who are out in all kinds of weather. Because when big things happen, you don't just watch. Because this is next. We are calling this a tier for response. That is the highest level of response that we have in the city. We are getting ready to deploy the maximum number of uh, snowplow responses that we ever have available in the city. Well, there's no stopping it now, folks. Storms are coming. 700 flights canceled at the airport. Denver gassing up its small but mighty snowplow fleet as what could be the metro area's biggest storm in a few years rolls off the foothills as rain for the time being. Evergreen and Aspen Park offer a preview of coming attractions. Those towns up the hill are in for a double matinee from this storm. Snow bands just won't quit. They will have the potential for feet of snow up there by tomorrow night. Kat Sam's along to explain when the rain turns to snow and what tomorrow's totals could look like. It looks impressive, Kyle, with snowfall rates of two to three inches an hour in the foothills. You can see how we could get the two to four feet. Here in Denver, it's heavy rain for the evening drive. That snow is going to really come in heavy, probably around 7.30, 8 o'clock tonight. Already seeing that in the foothills and mountains with reduced visibility. And the weather headlines include Denver under a winter storm warning through Friday morning with wet, heavy snow and major travel impacts. Many schools have reported closures, businesses doing the same. It was a mild afternoon and still mild out there at 42 degrees, hence the rain that's coming down. But the first wave of the storm has come in, generating winds out of the east and northeast. We call that upslope. And this is the bullseye area for where the east to northeast winds are going to push that moisture and hence the heaviest snow totals in that two to four foot range. The center of circulation, the upper level low, is over southern Nevada, and it's not going to move anywhere fast, pumping a whole lot of water into Colorado in the form of snow for the mountains. Rain, thunder and lightning here in the metro area, even some thunder snow in the foothills. All of this moisture filling in on the radar and then flipping over to snow in the next couple of hours as we see that colder air work in. Winter storm warning for Denver for 10 to 20 inches of snow, 4 to 8 for Fort Collins, but 2 to 4 feet in the foothill communities, which may be snowbound for the next day or two. The heavy rain continues until about 8, 9 o'clock. All snow, heavy snow overnight with snowfall rates of one to two inches per hour for a time. We do see some improvement, but not until Friday morning. So here are your totals. Denver again in the 10 to 20 inch range. Castle Rock, Kiowa, 14 to 24. Two to four feet in the magenta areas, the foothill areas. Four to eight for Fort Collins. Lighter amounts to the north and east. Rain now changing to snow over the next couple of hours. And your extended forecast does show that heavy snow event on Thursday, the whole day, clearing Friday, and then a beautiful weekend with sunshine and 40s for Saturday and Sunday. Kathy, thanks. So Denver's rolling out its 54 plows and its 36 baby plows. The city would prefer that we call those pickups with the smaller equipment residential plows, but baby plows sounds better, and you know what I mean. So the baby plows will hit the side streets tomorrow. Big plows will hit the main streets as all non-essential city services in Denver will shut down for the storm. Just a couple minutes ago, Denver opened its severe weather shelters at the former Best Western Hotel, Quebec and I-70, and the McNichols Building at Civic Center Park. They'll be open through Saturday morning. And the mayor says that Denver will also pause evictions from migrant shelters during the storm. I can hear the folks saying, of course, it snows a lot in Colorado in March. What is the big deal? And that's fair. I will take my cues from the communities that are used to a lot of snow and still expect this one to be pretty ugly. Like up in Evergreen, where 911 calls for help usually means some volunteer firefighter has to respond from home. Not easy in feet of snow. So our Mark Salinger's up there where the volunteer first responders are relocating for a couple of days, Mark, so they can have a faster response time. Yeah, Kyle, you want to know how 
they think it's going to be a big storm. When you have a fire truck like this with tires this size, and they're still worried it's not going to be able to get in the snow. They're putting chains on these fire trucks right now, and these guys are all volunteers. They don't usually spend the night here at the fire station. Tonight, though, they're all here. Regardless of your level of preparation, a big snowstorm is still a big snowstorm. While the rest of us volunteer to work from home these next couple days, volunteers here are preparing for a lot more work. Aside from our fire chief and our operations chief, all of our firefighters are volunteers up here. Evergreen Fire Rescue has 80 volunteer firefighters. Usually they respond to emergencies from home or work or wherever they are. Tonight, they're spending the night here. They're not luxurious hotel rooms by any means, but they are comfortable beds, a little bit of privacy, and a way for our firefighters to be more ready for any sort of emergency that might pop up. Einar Jensen is used to the snow in Evergreen. But with a storm like this, the department is staffing their stations to make sure firefighters aren't snowed in at home when someone calls 911. When we're expecting more than a foot of snow, firefighters who are able to will leave their families at their homes and come into the stations so that we can have a quicker response with our ambulances to be able to serve our community. Evergreen could soon be buried in snow. But in a town where a blizzard is nothing new, there are signs that Evergreen prepares for storms like this long before they pop up on radar. So the people that know what they're talking about, they're predicting two to four feet of snow in Evergreen. For some context, these tires, three feet tall. I'm five foot six. Some models are spitting out five feet of snow in Evergreen. Now you can see why Evergreen needs some big fire trucks. We do have some pretty big trucks, but those trucks require people to drive. And in this part of Colorado, all those people who drive those big trucks to emergencies are usually volunteering to work through the storm. The volunteer firefighters of Evergreen Fire Rescue are essential for our community. So this is the part of the newscast where we tell you all to stay home, especially if you don't have chains like this and tires like this. This is what they're putting on these fire trucks to try and make it through the snow. The rest of us don't have that at home, Kyle. That means we should probably go home and stay there for the next couple days. Yeah, believe your eyes. Your Prius doesn't stand a chance if that's what they're doing up there. Appreciate the sacrifice they're making to be away from their families for a couple nights and their jobs and everything else to protect their community. Exactly. All right, Mark Salinger, thank exactly. you. Exactly. Everybody here. As the foothills and the front range brace for the largest snowstorm in years, the search and rescue teams that work in those counties are prepared to be called out if people end up stuck in hard to reach places. That's the work that they do on a volunteer basis every week of the year, often spending their own money for gear and training to do it. That's why this week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign will pay for more equipment and more training. In Lake County, outside Leadville, that team needs a new snowmobile. In Werfano County, their volunteers provide most of their own gear, but they need safer helmets for their climbing rescues. Larimer County's team says they could use help with medical training for their volunteers. Park County Search and Rescue almost has enough to afford a new off-road vehicle for rescues, and they're hoping that maybe we could help them over the finish line. A lot of these needs are really $1,000 in this county, $1,000 in that county. So their umbrella nonprofit, Colorado Search and Rescue Association, is going to take all of the dollars that we raise and then do a micro-grant process for training and equipment for the volunteer teams that work in every county of Colorado to keep people safe in the outdoors. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to get that link to donate. I'll never ask you to give to a cause I don't support myself, and you've proven that even $5 helps. So as always, I'll match the first 50 donations of $5. These folks are out there in all kinds of weather at risk to themselves, often on their own dime, to keep us safe. We're also nearing almost 2,000 of you who have signed up to simplify your giving with a monthly donation to the Word of Thanks Fund. You put in that info once, and your donation will be split among every nonprofit we support together, including those search and rescue teams. You can use the same QR code or text to get there. Ken Buck's announcement yesterday was a gift to the Uniparty. Lauren Boebert decides she's gonna pick her battles and not run in two races at once. I'll explain why that's probably a smart call. And a prominent conservative in Colorado is once again calling for the execution of a political opponent. This time, it's the president he says he wants dead. An expert on extremism explains the true threat from saying things like that. 
The conservative political activist, who also owns DCF guns in Colorado, is calling for President Joe Biden to be killed, to be tried and executed for treason. It's not the first time Joe Oltman has called for the deaths of his political opponents. We now must beat the NRA again. I'm demanding a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. Look, I, I have gun stores and ranges. DCF Guns co-owner Joe Oltman. I'm not taking one gun off the shelf. Talking about President Biden on his nationally distributed show, Conservative Daily, last Friday. That is the definition of treason, and he should be hung by the neck until he's dead. Sorry, that's the, that's the consequence. You say, oh my gosh, you're calling for his death. I'm calling for him to be put on trial, held responsible for hurting Americans, for, for, for standing against the Constitution we have, and the consequence of that should be and is up to death. Oltman's call for President Biden's killing follows similar rhetoric about executing specific U.S. senators. This that he said about Democratic Governor Jared Polis. You are a traitor. <laughs> Gallows. And Oltman's call for mass hangings for treason. I, said I want to send the media to the gallows, the mainstream media to the gallows, radical leftists to the gallows, traitors to our nation to the gallows, and they all kind of fit in the same bucket. There's a term for this sort of uh, uh, violent rhetoric. Uh, it's called stochastic terrorism. Mark Pickavich has spent decades researching extremism in America. And the idea behind that is, is if you just flood the airwaves, flood the internet, flood everything um, with this sort of incitement um, that somebody somewhere is going to decide that it's time to do something and they're going to take some sort of violent action. Yet Oltman's extreme rhetoric has not convinced Colorado Republicans to cut ties. He was nominated by a prominent Republican from the floor of the state GOP assembly to run for governor in 2022. The eventual GOP nominee, Heidi Ganahl, came on a show to receive his endorsement. I gave you my 100% endorsement, and I think you can actually solve these problems. Just a few months ago, Oltman's DCF guns in Colorado Springs hosted a rally for a Republican congressional candidate who called for the arrest and treason trial of Colorado Supreme Court justices. You were rhetorically removing yourself from lynch mob violence. Pitkavich, the extremism researcher, says the way that Oltman frames his violent rhetoric through the idea of mass trials for treason is common in fringe circles. But in the end, you're just talking about killing someone because you disagree with their views. You're still talking about murder. Oltman was also the source of the unsupported claim that Denver-based Dominion voting system somehow conspired with Antifa to rig the 2020 election against Donald Trump. Oltman faces several defamation claims for that. Republican Representative Lauren Boebert is mad. She thinks Congressman Ken Buck is quitting Congress early next week just to block her effort to replace him. She might be right. So Boebert says now that she is not going to seek the special election nomination to replace Buck for the rest of the year. Here's the deal. She wasn't likely to get that because it's going to be decided by party insiders who have a dim view of Boebert's decision to switch districts to try and stay in Congress. So now Boebert's challenge is to win the GOP primary on the same day that some other Republican is going to win the special election. Both races are on June 25th. Confusing, right? Many voters may just want to pick one GOP candidate. Well, now you get it. Buck setting up two elections on the same day makes it harder for Boebert to win. Ken Buck's announcement yesterday was a gift to the Uniparty. The establishment concocted a swampy backroom deal to try to rig an election. This will confuse voters and it will re result in a lame duck congressman on day one and leave the fourth district with no representation for more than three months. Buck's resignation puts Boebert in a corner because his move narrows the Republican majority in the U.S. House. If Boebert had decided to run for that special election and won it, she'd have to resign her seat, and that would have then reduced the GOP's edge in the House to a single vote. So she's not even going to try that. She'll hope her huge fundraising edge and name recognition helps her win a now uniquely tough race in June. The few snowflakes we are seeing in the foothills are going to need a lot of their friends to fulfill the forecast. Whether you're hoping for boom or bust, We'll tell you what indicators you should be looking for in the morning. Next. Do not be fooled by the snow you wake up to on the ground tomorrow morning, because the storm will just be getting started. 
Meteorologist Chris Bianchi breaks down the early indicators we can all watch for to see if this is going to be a bust or live up to forecast expectations. Well, we've got a major snowstorm heading to Denver, which means the question that you're probably asking, how much snow will fall at my house? So if you want a lower end snowfall amount, you don't want as much snow, you want the snow rain to kind of mix around until after midnight. That's when we would transition over to fully snow. We have lower snowfall ratios overnight. But if you want a boom of a snowstorm, you want the foot and a half, 18, 19 inch snowfall event, you want that transition to take place earlier before midnight between about 6 and 9 p.m., which seems possible for us between now and 9 p.m. And then we would have two to three inch per hour snowfall rates overnight. So I always like to look at it from a confidence-based perspective. Remember, we're forecasting, we're predicting the future. Um, it's not necessarily a forecast, right? So the most likely scenario is we end up with 10 to 20 inches worth of snowfall. That's a wide range. But if you want that lower end scenario, then we've got that mixing taking place until after midnight. But if you want the higher end scenario, then we flip over quick with those high snow rates overnight. Okay, so that might be science, but then I also need you to keep an eye on the bananas. If you've been through a few winters with Next, you know that that is how we have measured storms, or at least measured how worried people are about the storms, because other states, their stores run out of bread or milk. But for years, Next viewers have noticed Coloradans pilfer the piles of bananas. It looks for now like people in Denver are feeling confident, because there are plenty at the Safeway on Downing and Evans, or at least plenty of those expensive organic ones. They're ridiculous. They're also smaller, too. Something's going on in Arvada, though. A viewer sent us this photo. Shoppers stocking up on boxes of bananas or empty banana boxes. What does this suggest about the forecast? I don't know. I'm not a bananaologist. This is just how we measure storms around here. Keep an eye on the bananas and keep the photos coming to next at 9news.com. Back with your feedback. Colorado's volunteer search and rescue teams are ready to go out in this week's nasty weather if needed. People find themselves stuck in remote locations. Let's help those nonprofits get the gear and training that they need and that they often pay for themselves. This week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign will create small grants through their statewide association to go to search and rescue teams all over the state for specific needs. Like Route County's volunteers need a new snowmobile. Alamosa County's folks are hoping to afford additional rescue training. There's needs like that in every county in our state, urban, suburban, and rural. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to join me and a bunch of others in giving. You'll see the option to give either just this week or make it simpler by giving to every Word of Thanks nonprofit we feature through a monthly donation to the Word of Thanks Fund. Okay, let's talk bananas. Leslie in Highlands Ranch says she thinks a big storm is coming based on the banana forecast at her local King Supers. Let's go to the high country. Holly and Buena Vista reports that she went to the supermarket this morning and out comes an older, white-haired, bearded guy carrying a single purchase, a big bunch of bananas. He knows. Chris in Edgewater writes in to say, that their bananas are low, but there are plenty of plantains. Again, folks, it's not scientific, but it's the best measure that we have. If you can send us a banana forecast, next at 9news.com is the email. Stay safe. Hope you got your bananas. See you next time.